Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of Patcast. Today is Tuesday, September 19th, 2023. I'm Rifat Manan in California, and I am remotely joined by my good friend Emilia Madrigal in Boston. Today, we are very delighted to welcome back Dr. Theonia Boyd, uh, who has presented several talks earlier. And Dr. Boyd is professor of pathology at Texas uh, Children's Hospital and Baylor College of Medicine uh, in Texas. And today she is going to present a talk on pediatric pathology. And the title of her talk is going to be Stillbirth Placenta and Fetus. And today's session is joined specially by pathology residents and fellows at Texas Children's Hospital and the pathology residents at University of North Carolina. Special shout out to all of you guys for joining today's session. And as always, feel free to post your questions and comments on YouTube and Facebook chat windows. And I will pass them on to Dr. Boyd towards the end of the session. And thank you, Dr. Boyd, for joining us today. Over to you now. Thank you so much. Uh, can every can you see, uh, Dr. Manan, can you see my uh, yeah. slide? Okay, so I'm good yes. to go. And I'm going to stop sharing my, my videos. So let me do that first. Uh, come on, there we go. Okay, yeah, so thank you. You should still be able to hear me. All right, so this is the banner that I was asked to present uh, that identifies this particular podcast. Here is the uh, title slide and uh, of note, th this is a slide that is almost all visual, very few words, and, and I did that on purpose. This is actually a new talk I put together that is um, a composite of many years worth of old talks, and I, I quite enjoyed myself. So hopefully it will be at least uh, informative to those of you. And it's using visual inf information to establish causation and timing of intrauterine demise. Does the silence mean this link isn't working? Hi, Dr. Trini. So it looks like that the YouTube link is uh, Yeah, YouTube link is working the, now. Not, not the Teams link, apparently. OK, can you still hear me? There was some chatter. Yeah, yeah, we can, don't worry. So let's start with uh, observations about the umbilical cord. This is a uh, slide of a normal term placenta. The arrows are from the pictorial of a book chapter identifying the various uh, parts of the placenta, the umbilical cord, extra placental membranes. Uh, it, from this view, the chorionic plate or fetal surface, and then of course the placental disc proper. So what is it that I can glean from this uh, this placenta that I'm telling you comes from a stillbirth, just from visual inspection. The first thing that, that at least I notice is that the umbilical cord is inserted uh, either marginally or just barely velamentously, but it's an abnormal cord insertion. The fragment of tissue that is at the bottom um, is, uh, uh, is detached from the placental disc, so it was detached during delivery. Um, uh, and the, um, the umbilical cord is discolored. And that's really what I wanted to show you, this ruddy red-brown discoloration. All that tells you and me is that this is a, a placenta belonging to a stillbirth. Now I can glean additional information from this uh, visual and I'll come back to this point later, but there's virtually no blood in the chorionic vessels. So it's the fetal blood that we can see in the fetal vasculature is profoundly hypo or avolemic. You can't see it in the umbilical cord again because the ruddy, of the ruddy red brown discoloration, which I presume is uh, blood breakdown products following stillbirth. And here's a lower power view of a, a three vessel umbilical cord from a stillbirth placenta. And there's really very little to glean from this power, except I don't see raging uh, vasculitis, umbilical vasculitis, for example, I see three vessels. There might be a little bit of edema over on the right, but otherwise there's not much to glean. However, if one looks at a placenta and the umbilical cord microscopically from a stillbirth, let's start on the left. If it's a relatively what I call fresh stillbirth, meaning the interval between demise and delivery is somewhere on the order of 
hours, but not longer, you may begin to see on the left-hand slide loss of nuclear detail. So there, there may be a loss of the hematoxylophilic staining of the umbilical cord smooth muscle nuclei. But what is more typical by the time um, a stillborn fetus is delivered is that more time has passed between the demise and the delivery. That's often because it takes time clinically to recognize even a demise. And the changes that will, you, will, you can see in the stillbirth cord uh, can look quite different. And let me go to the right-hand side. The, the smooth muscle cells of the umbilical uh, myocytes have now become detached from one another. So they've lost their intercellular bridges and they're, they're uh, wavy or wrinkly. That is a stillbirth change. If you see this change in an umbilical cord, it means that it is a from a, a, a stillborn fetus. The, the uh, warning about this is not only does it help you identify stillbirth, but it can also be confused with vasculitis because pycnotic myocytes may round up and uh, look like, for example, on the right-hand side, a, a neutrophil, and in the middle panel down at the bottom at about 5.30, uh, another neutrophil. These are all uh, stillbirth changes in myocytes and should not be interpreted as vasculitis. Another common feature in stillbirth umbilical cords is the presence of normoblastemia, that is an excess or, or markedly increased uh, circulating nucleated red blood cells. When they are this, uh, this prominent in any field, uh, it causes almost always an hypoxic, non-acute hypoxic mode of demise because it takes time for this number of uh, nucleated red cells to be released from the fetal body from preformed, uh, largely hepatic, but bone marrow stores as well and into the fetal circulation. You will get uh, normal blasts in uh, infectious causes of demise, but but the uh, normal blast response is not as um, is not as intense as it is with hypoxic modes of demise. Uh, and this is, for example, the kind of of, uh, of visual slide you'd see if this was a parvovirus B19. Uh, etiology of demise, except you'd see the parvovirus nuclear inclusions in the NRBCs. And I've given a lecture on meconium and NRBC, so I'm not going to uh, belabor that topic terribly much. Other uh, gr gross visual images from the umbilical cord. So on the left-hand panel is a uh, three-vessel cord, and you can see this clotted uh, umbilical vein a cast of blood. There is no way this could be postmortem. This is this does not happen postmortem. So this is an antemortem umbilical thrombus. As it as you see on the right side panel, this candy cane stripe is thrombosis of the umbilical vein. If you if you examine your placentas fresh, it's quite helpful in identifying whether or not clotted fetal blood in the placenta is anti versus postmortem because in the fresh state. Fetal blood, even with stillbirth, is readily movable in the through the umbilical vessels or the, the chorionic vessels on the fetal surface of the placenta. Whereas if you examine your placentas after formal infixation, you will get uh, you will get complexing of the, the blood elements so that they are they become you know semi-solid, right? So for formalin will solidify blood, and therefore you can't use that as a visual and, and tactile clue when you're trying to assess just from gross inspection a cause of stillbirth. And in the middle panel is uh, a stillbirth change. That ruddy brown discoloration that I showed you on the first slide will change to this dark gray brown uh, appearance following formal infixation. And I guess I did not say this, but what I'm trying to do with this lecture largely are to show general features of stillbirth. I'm not trying to talk about specific causes of stillbirth. I'll give you a few examples of that nearer to the end of the lecture, but I mostly wanted to talk about general features that can be seen that you can pick up, again, just from gross examination. On the left-hand side is a, a stillbirth placenta. Again, again, that ruddy brown umbilical cord discoloration. It probably takes about a day between demise and delivery to begin to see this discoloration grossly. Um, what I can also appreciate uh, in the left-hand panel is that the extra placental membranes are opaque um, and the fetal surface, although I can't quite tell with them, I can also see the fetal surface is discolored. And this is likely meconium that is sitting still atop the uh, chorionic surface uh, that, and has not yet been taken up into the, um, the chorionic macrophages. And it, the fact that it has this 
uh, green brownish discoloration, which suggests that the meconium was discharged for a while prior to delivery, not fresh meconium. And on the right hand panel is a, a, another stillbirth cord. This one happens to be quite flattened. Uh, and has a yellower discoloration. So it doesn't have a ruddy brown discoloration, but the yellower discoloration is likely due to meconium uptake in the umbilical cord uh, because this is old meconium discoloration that can impart a, um, that actually can impart a more tan or tan green hue. And either of these uh, placentas could also have uh, acute chorioamnionitis. So the presence of meconium does not exclude uh, other findings that will discolor the extra placental membranes, the cord, or the chorionic plate. Uh, to talk about meconium microscopically, again, I already gave a lecture on this, so I'm just going to touch on it uh, briefly. But on the right-hand panel, the larger panel, this light brown discoloration that is within uh, macrophage cytoplasm is pretty characteristic of relatively recently uh, discharged meconium that's just been taken up into the, uh, into the stroma, the amnion stroma of the extraplacental membranes. On the left-hand side is meconium, but it has a darker, in this view, has a darker orangey-brown discoloration. There's also, in both cases, this frothy, this frothy change uh, probably from, from lysosomes uh, of the amnion epithelium that can, all, can be seen in meconium. My caveat, particularly about the left-hand slide, and I'm sure I said this when I gave the meconium lecture, is that not all brown pigmented macrophages are meconium macrophages in the amnion uh, and, or, uh, and or fetal surface uh, of the placenta. Um, so excuse me for a minute. I, I, uh, that's one of my colleagues calling. Just a second. I'm giving a lecture. Okay, fine. Um, so, sorry about that. So, if you have brown discolored uh, macrophages, whether it's light brown, orangey brown, dark brown, you have to you have to be sure it's meconium, or at least I do. So, I require a second piece of information to it, it to identify that what I'm seeing are in fact meconium laden macrophages. I either need a clinical history of meconium discharge, an appropriately discolored placenta and or umbilical cord, or to see particulate meconium. And that's this next panel, because there is nothing that looks like particulate meconium, that is meconium that was discharged in the amniotic fluid, but not yet taken up into the placental macrophages prior to delivery. And, and this is what it looks like. It has this orange-brown globular appearance in both panels. So here, here on the left-hand panel, I'm looking at it at about uh, one o'clock. Down here, it's at about 6.30 or 7 on the left-hand panel. In the right-hand panel, it's uh, at pretty much center. There's a little bit more to the left at 3 o'clock and some more at uh, like 5.30 and at 6 o'clock. The, the meconium can look, when it's, when it's not yet been taken up, globular and amorphous like this. It sometimes looks like large, uh, plus large platelets, but brown discolored, so large granular material. But this is particulate meconium. And where you look for, should look for it is uh, entrapped in the extraplacental membranes between the membrane rolls, because whatever's in the amniotic fluid settles onto the membranes and the fetal surface prior to delivery. And so it tends to get caught up when you make your membrane rolls. So I either require a clinical history of meconium, uh, appropriately discolored uh, uh, placenta and or uh, particulate or free meconium. On the left-hand panel, these are meconium-laden macrophages down in the extraplacental membrane decidua. And by the time they, they reach the depth of the, of the decidua, enough time has elapsed so that this, uh, this frothy uh, appearance to the cytoplasm is because the meconium has been taken up into, into lysosomes. Um, and, and so that is a typical appearance. But again, if you see what you think is meconium in the decidua, because it tracks from the, the uh, amniotic fluid, you should also be seeing it through the amnion and chorion stroma and into the decidua. It shouldn't be just in the decidua. And on the right-hand side is uh, meconium uptake. These are actually macrophages. It's a pale brown, orangey brown, but macrophages within the umbilical cord uh, it's very hard to see meconium in the umbilical cord, even when the umbilical cord is grossly meconium stained. Um, and, uh, and so this is one of the relatively fewer times where I've been able to see it well enough to take a photograph to share with others. 
Here's a particular feature of uh, umbilical cord myocyte change when uh, with prolonged meconium discharge. And again, I'm sure I showed some version of this um, uh, in, uh, in the last lecture I gave on meconium and NRVCs. This is meconium-induced umbilical vascular necrosis. And so the longer meconium is present in the amniotic fluid prior to demise or delivery, the deeper it will travel into the tissues of, of the placenta, all the tissues that are in contact with the amniotic fluid. So extra placental membranes, chorionic plate, and umbilical cord. If the uh, meconium travels deep enough to hit the umbilical or chorionic vessels, so fetal vessels, it can induce a chemical necrosis, a bile acid necrosis. So this is a chemotoxic change um, to uh, umbilical myocytes. And they, again, become discohesive and they become pycnotic and rounded up, as you see in both the left and right-hand panels. Uh, in addition, on the right-hand side, I believe at about, uh, about somewhere between uh, uh, 12 and three o'clock uh, or 12 and six o'clock, there are a couple of um, uh, meconium macrophages. And so occasionally you can see the meconium macrophages admixed with the, the pycnotic myocytes, but again, they are hard to see and sometimes you don't. But this is absolutely diagnostic of meconium vascular necrosis. Now there are mimics that can look like this, including stillbirth changes. So you have to be careful and have confidence in what you're calling meconium vascular necrosis is that, i.e. you need to see deep meconium elsewhere in the placenta. And here are uh, many, many gross uh, photos of umbilical cord changes with fetal demise. And this is from uh, my fetal vascular malperfusion lecture. So let me start on the top left-hand panel. Obviously, this is a hypercoiled umbilical cord, and it also has that ruddy brown stillbirth di discoloration. To the right of that is an umbilical cord that is maybe a little bit hypercoiled at its uh, cut end toward the fetal surface, but is flattened here near the placental insertion. And that's because this was an umbilical cord wrapped tightly around the fetal leg. And it was that compression of the, of the umbilical vessels that led to fatal fetal vascular malperfusion. In the right-hand panel next to that, you see the cut surface of a placenta. These are markedly distended uh, chorionic vessels. I tell trainees that if you look at a glass slide and you can readily see the chorionic vessels, that means that they are, they are, they are pathologically dilated. And in these uh, cross-sections of the uh, chorionic vessels, um, I can see, I'm not sure it projects, but I can see the layering right, of, of an organizing clot. And on the right-hand side is a bilobate placenta. Uh, this is a case of fe fatal fetal vascular malperfusion. This is a mom with a bicornuate uterus, the placenta inserted in the uterine septum, and the lobes grew in e either horn, and the umbilical cord itself was velamentously inserted between the lobes, overlying the uterine septum, and the fetal body apparently rested upon the umbilical cord and led to Fetal that fatal fetal vascular malperfusion. And on the, the surface of the placenta, I can see on the right-hand side of the umbilical cord, uh, a, a markedly dilated and no doubt thrombosed chorionic vessel. And the same with, the same with a last uh, on, on the left-hand side. Lower left-hand panel, again, market, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, the middle panel is a true knot, and this is a, a case of fetal demise. And you can see on the left-hand side that the, uh, the, the dark, gray brown, so this is probably post-fixation, discoloration of stillbirth. And on the, the right-hand side, it's white probably because it's avolemic since through the true knot, the, the fetal blood could not flow. So this is a true knot leading to fatal fetal vascular malperfusion. Directly under it is a chorionic plate uh, with markedly dilated and in the fresh state thrombosed uh, chorionic vessels. And they, are, they have these streaks of white. The white are, is gonna be organized fi fibrin. Uh, more likely than not, uh, unless you get to the right-hand panel where you see this white-colored chorionic uh, vessel, these white-colored chorionic vessels, but they are mineralized. You see they're, they're, the lumens are virtually ab ablated, obliterated. So this is calcification. But at any rate, when you see these thrombosed surface vessels with white discoloration, it's either going to be organizing thrombi, organized thrombi, or uh, mineralization, calcified or remote thrombi. Here is uh, an example of a fetus. This, these are two uh, 
to different fetuses, one, one, both of them fatal fetal vascular malperfusion. What I'm trying to point out on the left-hand side is that there's an indentation, a nuchal indentation from the umbilical cord having been wrapped tightly around the neck. Now you sometimes get postmortem changes as we all know uh, in, in the skin and subcutis. So the neck is a little bit harder to discern whether, whether what you have is pathologic unless in this case, I knew it was a tightly wrapped nuchal cord. And, but on the right-hand side is the, uh, is the uh, lower right leg, it looks like, of the fetus where I said the, it was uh, the, the malperfusion demise was due to the umbilical cord being tightly wrapped around the fetal leg. So it's tightly wrapped around the fetal ankle and you can see the subcutaneous uh, tissue skin subcute compression from that tightly wrapped nuchal cord. So again, providing visual, informa visual information to aid you just in your initial ex gross exams. And on the left-hand side, to point out a few more things, there is early skin slippage or maceration on the left arm. You can see it, um, the skin, uh, uh, the, the epidermis rising because of fluid off of the dermis. These are early stillbirth changes, and this follows a fairly stereotypical pattern of progression of maceration. I'll talk a little bit more of that later. The last thing I'll say is that on the right-hand side, uh, at the right shoulder, it looks to me like I can see some meconium staining of the skin. So this was uh, would have been non-acute meconium discharge prior to demise. Now let's move to the extraplacental membranes. There are, there are relatively few stillbirth changes that, um, that can occur in, uh, in, stillbirth membra in stillbirth membranes that are bare talking about, but one of them is this. You can get this very bland maternal inflammatory response, I presume to non-viable antigens um, in, the, in the amniotic fluid or, or even in the placenta itself. So you get this very bland neutral, neutrophil inf infiltration that if days have passed between demise and delivery may also uh, include neutrophil karyorexis as we see here. So don't confuse this with anti-mortem acute chorioamnionitis as a cause of death. This is passive post-mortem inflammation that is maternal. Of course, when the fetus dies, there's no more fetal inflammation that will be propagated. So you will not see this. This is just a maternal inflammatory response, this very bland post-mortem, uh, quote unquote, acute deciduitis or chorionitis. Uh, and another thing to say about this field is this: these, these two images would have been from stillbirths that likely occurred days before delivery, hence the, the, the neutrophil karyorexis, even the, you know, the infiltration and then the karyorexis. But you can use that kind of time frame to also look to compare with other pieces of information about the, the interval between demise and delivery, such as, for example, the extent of external skin slippage or maceration. Here is a case uh, of a stillbirth, and I can see a, uh, an acute chorionitis in the extraplacental membranes. This may or may not be a stillbirth change, and I would suspect that it may not be for a couple of reasons. I don't remember the details of this image, but number one, uh, the neutrophils are intact. Number two, they're pretty well aggregated at the interface between the chorion epithelium and the chorion stroma. And this, for example, could have been a fetal demise due to to uh, congenital group B sepsis, because group B is notorious for uh, not eliciting an, an intense inflammatory response and yet is a very virulent organism. Let's go to the placental disc and microscopic changes that are changes of intrauterine demise, not specific cause of demise changes, but intrauterine demise changes. Okay. Again, uh, is it, uh, in the middle top panel is the, the image of uh, NRVCs, normal blastemia that I showed you in the cord. On the left-hand panel is a uh, fairly close uh, uh, high power view of chorionic villi, and I can see karyorectic intravascular cells. These are probably karyorectic neutrophil, I mean, uh, NRVCs. So this is about the first change you can see that's uh, in postmortem placentas is karyorexis of uh, the fetal vascular nucleated cellular elements. And this same uh, karyorectic cell on the right, right hand side is, uh, is shown on higher power for you. So that's the first change. And that probably occurs probably within about 24 hours between demise and delivery. 
But if it's a, if it's a demise that occurred, let's say during labor, you of course would not see this. Okay, let me re refresh your, your uh, memories briefly about the fetal circulation of the placenta because the next many images are gonna be talking at some length about this, which is that I liken the fetal vascular tree and I apologize to all of my colleagues and trainees who've already heard me say this many times, but I liken the fetal vascular tree to an upside down tree in the environment where the umbilical vessels are the tree trunk, their primary branches are the, are the chorionic vessels. They then branch into the muscular stem vessel branches, ultimately culminating in the terminal villi. Um, which are the equivalent of the leaves on, uh, on a tree of, in the environment, the chorionic villi. So anything that restricts umbilical blood flow is going to preferentially restrict flow out of the placenta through the umbilical cord because the umbilical vein is more compressible than the arteries. The really core design problem with this is, as we know, the umbilical vein carries, carries the entirety of oxygen and nutrient supply for a fetus in utero. And so it, it is a poor engineering design, the umbilical cord. And I've said that for, for decades now in lectures. At any rate, when you get restriction of, uh, or cessation of flow, restriction or sensation, cessation at the umbilical cord level, you very rarely see cord changes that reflect that. Rather, you see them in the muscular and capillary vessels uh, within the placental disc proper. And so you can see it within the muscular vessels, you can see if it's an active site of clotting, a thrombus, that's always antemortem. I'll show you some photos. Or, and or you can see downstream loss of fetal vascular flow. So you'll see uh, uh, avascular villi or its predecessor, VSK, villus stromal vascular cariorexis. I'll show you those. The, the reason I'm belaboring this a little bit is because when a fetus dies, all fetal blood flow into the placenta stops. And so with the passage of time between demise and delivery, you're going to get progressive fetal vascular involution. And this is one of the toughest uh, differentials to sort out in, in postmortem cases where the demise to delivery interval has been days or longer, and you think it may be due to fetal vascular malperfusion, is trying to parse out what cessation of fetal flow changes preceded demise and which are a consequence of demise. So in a general sense, when fetal blood stops flowing at the cord level because of of demise, regardless of the cause of demise, you will get progressive global loss of uh, fetal vascular integrity in the placenta. And so the end result of that at the capillary level will be avascular villi. The end result of that in the stem vessels are going to be the most advanced stage of what we call stem vessel obliteration. I will show you those changes. And one of the most helpful hints Two of the most helpful hints in discriminating the two is with fetal, fetal death, the blood flow stops, in, stops and affects the placenta globally. And so the changes that you see should be relatively uniform across the placenta. The second thing is you can compare the, the changes, how long the demise to delivery interval is, or that you imagine based on other autopsy uh, uh, features, for example, gross examination or microscopic with the evolution of changes that you see in the fetal vasculature. And the third thing I guess I should say is if you see clotting, fibrin applied to the wall of a muscular vessel, chorionic or stem, that is always anti-mortem. So now let me tell you what I'm talking about. All right, here I have a field, a high power field that's slightly out of focus of avascular villi. And I see some, uh, some uh, stromal mineral, mineralization, probably trophoblast basement membrane plus stromal mineralization. Both of these changes can be postmortem changes. If this were strictly due to a prolonged postmortem interval, that is, let's say the fetus died from, uh, from uh, let, me, let me think, um, some congenital infection that, that where there are no placental footprints. Let's say the demise and, and the fetus was exceedingly macerated at delivery and the demise, the, the last time mom felt the baby move was two weeks ago. This is likely to be passive postmortem involution if it's applied globally throughout the placenta. In contrast, you take that same image on the left. If you look at the middle panel, you have temporal heterogeneity of the vast fetal vascular involutional changes in this mid panel 
uh, image where at the top you have avascular villi and at the back at the bottom you have the intermediary step villus stromal vascular cariorexis both both of these patterns represent fully interrupted fetal blood flow into the capillary level fetal vascular tree but the avascular villi preceded the villus stromal vascular cariorexis so that if, if I want to say that VSK takes days, uh, avascular villi takes weeks, at least a week, but weeks. And so you have temporal heterogeneity. That is a very, very, very good clue that at least some of this is not passive postmortem involution, that there was temporal heterogeneity to the lack of flow prior to demise. And so this almost certainly, just this image tells me it's a fetal vascular malperfusion cause of death. The same way, and it's easier on the right-hand panel, you have avascular villi on the right side of the image and still vascularized uh, villi in the lower left. Um, these actually do not look normal, but it's not a, not a, 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 talk, a pattern I want to talk about right now. Just to show this temporal heterogeneity is indicative that, that there was cessation of fetal flow to a portion of the placenta prior to fetal demise. You can also get avascular villi in the setting of chronic villitis. So there are some avascular villi here in the left-hand side of the edge of the, the chronic villitis. Um, but these you can usually tell because you'll, you'll see the culprit. You'll see at least some residuum of chronic villitis, whether it's infectious or the, the so-called VUE, non-infectious chronic villitis. Um, I want to talk about this again uh, because now I want to talk about the changes that, that apply to the chorionic and the, the stem vessels, the muscular fetal vessels of the placenta. And this is one point I'm going to make is slightly more complicated, and I hope I get it across. If you have clotting at, at, within these muscular vessels, as I said, you will see thrombosis, right? You will see fibrin applied to or incorporated into the wall of the, the muscular vessel. If, however, you catch a muscular vessel where the loss of flow was somewhere upstream or downstream, you're not going to see clotting, but you will see other changes because you have no flow within the muscular vessels. And this again, in this postmortem, is it FVM that caused the demise or is it the demise to delivery interval changes that are, that are uniform across placentas? It's hard to, it can be very hard to tell in these muscular vessels. So let me see if I can explain this to you. Okay. So this is a high power view of advanced stem vessel obliteration. On the right-hand side, this is a stem, a stem vessel. On the right-hand side is a fully avascular, you know, almost avascular muscular, uh, muscular stem vessel. On the left-hand side, it looks like recanalization. Recanalization does not occur in placentas. Rather, what you're seeing is following demise, there will be this bland, fibroblast or myofibroblastic ingrowth into the lumen of these muscular vessels. This is the pattern of passive postmortem uh, stem vessel obliteration. This is not fetal vascular malperfusion diagnostic. It can be a, a company fetal vascular malperfusion, but these are vessels that have lost flow somewhere up or downstream. These are not vessels that, that are, have, uh, have undergone clotting. On the left-hand side is another image of a very high power stem vessel. And again, you see this advanced stem vessel obliteration with a nearly, a nearly avascular lumen. On the left-hand side, you, this is a change of stem vessel obliteration that I would call kind of in the intermediate phase, although we don't really apply these temporal times. I'm, for the sake of the explanation, I'm telling you this. And what you see are is a, a more dilated uh, stem vessel because these were taken at the, well, no, actually this is a higher magnification on the left and right. So markedly dilated stem vessel with this, this uh, myofibroblastic ingrowth. So it's not clotted um, and, and you have these, this disintegration or, you know, uh, 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 disintegration uh, fragmentation of uh, fetal red blood cells. I suspect that this would have been a stem vessel vein. And the reason I'm saying this, it looks to me like blood was trying to get out of the vein through the cord when there was, when there was either a clot upstream or fetal demise. And so you're left with a dilated vessel where the blood has, is no longer flowing, but you still have some pressure being applied up to the time of fetal demise. So, so you've got that vascular ectasia. That requires 
having seen a lot of placentas to be able to kind of sort that out. What I'm more interested in telling you is these are the patterns of stem vessel obliteration and absent fibrin in muscular vessels, you can't tell just from an image whether it's anti-mortem or post-mortem. This is what anti-mortem thrombosis looks like. You must have fibrin applied to a, a, a muscular fetal vessel wall, and it's almost always chorionic or stem vessel, with loss of endothelial integrity, and you get this extravasation of erythrocytes into the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the vessel wall you know, next to the lumen of the vessel. So fibrin adherent to the vessel wall with loss of endothelial integrity, and, and, um, uh, and extravasation of red cells. This is a fibrin clot that's becoming incorporated into this stem vessel. So this is an organizing thrombus. And this, this myxoidy change, this myofibroblastic proliferation is the change that occurs in order to, over time, to incorporate the fibrin clot, right? So this is an organizing thrombus. These are both anti-mortem processes. Fibrin, I, I'm going to say it for the 17th time, fibrin adherence uh, uh, to the wall of a fetal muscular vessel is only an anti-mortem phenomenon. All right, now let me show you some specific examples uh, of fetal death and uh, some of the changes that we can see. Um, for our trainees who are listening, uh, we generally do not show stillbirth fetuses where there's any, any risk of identification of the fetus, but these are all from my historical files. They long preceded my travels to Houston. And so um, I elected to in include them because there are things that I would like to talk about. So on the left-hand side, we have uh, twins uh, that have discordant growth. Uh, to the immediate right, we have the fetal surface of their shared placenta. Um, and you see congestion or engorgement or dilatation of the chorionic vessels on the left and relative hypo or avolemia on the right. You also see a stillbirth cord change on the left and none on the right. And the underside, you see the, the very same pattern of uh, capillary congestion. It would have been on the left image and this, this on the right, you know, because you've turned it over. So it's a mirror image. And this is one of the very, very rare times I have seen grossly evident twin-twin uh, transfusion as a cause of fetal demise based on the placenta alone. And so, so that, that, that you have here, let me talk about the microscopic image. Like, again, this is just so uncommon to be able to see this so clearly diagnostically that you have these congested capillaries on the left-hand side and hypo to um vessels on the right-hand side. So this is the microscopic counterpart of this blood differential that you're seeing in the gross images. And of course, these, this occurs in uh, monochorionic diamniotic twin placentations. The other thing that I want to say about this particular image is that you can't, we, I can use this ruddy discoloration of the skin to tell you as an audience that these are stillbirth fetuses. They, they both were, were stillborn. I can't tell you which fetus died before the other, because what can happen is that let's say you have you have um, a this being a donor twin delivering its blood through the placenta into the recipient twin. Let's say the donor twin dies first. Then you would think that the donor twin is going to be pale because it, the, the donor twin is chronically anemic. However, that twin then becomes an essential vascular sink for the, the co-twin so that the recipient is still having forward pressure fetal blood flow from cardiac output and can literally bleed into the donor twin so that this donor twin who may have been very pale prior to demise now come, now looks plethoric just like the recipient. So the ruddy brown discoloration in this context can tell you that they were both stillborn but doesn't tell you which fetus died first. Next example. This is an example of uh, a pre-viable delivery. And this is what I call a fresh stillbirth, which means that the fetus was alive at the start of labor and could not survive the physiologic stressors of labor and was either stillborn or had uh, you know, a little bit of cardiac output for some, some minutes of time. Um, and, and so if you see a fetus like this, where the, the skin is absolutely intact, no discoloration, then you know the fetus died shortly prior to delivery. 
On the left-hand side, I see opaque chorionic platen membranes. Indeed, this is uh, acute chorioamnionitis. The point I want to make about this image, the second point I want to make is all of this clot, sometimes these fetuses and placentas come down as abruption, but it's not abruption in the kind of chronic hypertensive sense or hypertensive sense of abruption arterial abruption, what this is, is inflammation of the basal vesicula so that the maternal vessels get disrupted and you get this, what I call inflammatory abruption as a secondary feature, but it's sometimes so prominent that the clinicians will send the placenta and or fetus down and they'll say abruption, you know, this is in the pre-viable period. So you may have uh, a brisk chorioamnionitis in the extraplacental membranes. Fetuses that are this immature rarely produce a fetal, fetal inflammatory response. Um, e even if they're, e even if prolonged, uh, even with prolonged amniotic fluid infection because their immune systems are so immature. However, even if you have no fetal infl inflammatory response within the placenta, you may have congenital sepsis. So the, this is a, these are a three, three glomeruli and you can see in the glomerular uh, capillaries, you see these uh, seeds of, of cocci, right, that have overgrown following fetal demise. So this is congenital sepsis. Here are two fetuses, different causes of the dem of demise. On the right-hand side, there is the, the, a relatively fresh demise because you, I see no skin slippage, and yet I do see a, a ruddy, I mean, a, a plethoric uh, hue to the fetus. And again, the ruddy brown, red-brown discoloration of the cord. Given the facial features, this is probably a trisomy 21 fetus that underwent, uh, that, that uh, had, uh, that suffered intrauterine demise probably in the, I would say, mid to late second trimester. Uh, on the left-hand side is a, a stillbirth fetus that has a large mass. This was a sacrococcygeal teratoma. They tried to deliver this fetus, um, this fetus vaginally and uh, the teratoma, as it were, decapitated. In other words, it, it detached from the fetus prior to delivery. And so the fetus was stillborn. The, you can see though, that this is an, an intrapartum demise because again, there is no discoloration of the umbilical cord of the skin. And this degree of plethora to the, uh, to the cephalic end of the fetus is probably because the fetus was uh, head first, was being delivered vaginally. And so this is um, this is dependent accumulation of fetal blood. So I'm, what I'm trying to point out is just from gross exam, you can acquire a fair amount of, of information that is useful in putting together an overall cause and timing of stillbirth. Um, and microscopically, the only thing that, that I saw other than sacrococcygeal teratoma in this fetus is normal blastemia because the, the fetus was delivered due to high drops and uh, car congenital and, and cardiac failure, high output cardiac failure due to perfusion of this very large sacrococcygeal teratoma. Here is a stillbirth fetus in the late second trimester. This is gastroschisis. That's not what I want to talk about. What I want to show, say on the left is that um, there is virtually complete epidermal um, slip, skin slippage or maceration. So the only epidermis that's left, I see it on the palms of the hands, this is all the shiny dermis underneath. But the fetus, aside from the gastroschisis, look at how prominent the rib cage is. So second trimester fetuses do, don't have much subcutaneous fat. This is a malnourished, chronically malnourished second trimester fetus. This is the placenta, which shows temporally heterogeneous placental infarcts involving virtually the entire placenta. So looking at the right-hand image alone of the placenta, I can say unequivocally there is some sort of maternal disorder that predisposes to thrombosis, right, thrombosis and or abruption, like hypertensive type disorders and some forms of maternal autoimmunity have this very same fetal and plac well, placental phenotype. And in fact, this was a mom who was discovered to have uh, be markedly positive for the lupus anticoagulant family of antibodies. And that was the mechanism of her demise. And this, this was recurrent until her underlying uh, auto, autoimmune condition was discovered and she could be treated. Here is one of the few slides that has some, uh, some text in it because uh, this was used for, I, I elected not to take it out. These, these are some not obvious features perhaps. You have a fetus, a fetus that is uh, stillborn, it's very pale. So there's somatic, somatic and internally you could see visceral pallor. On, underneath that, there was in the placenta, a fresh intervillous thrombus, 
with nucleated red blood cells. So you know at least some component of this is fetal blood. Elsewhere in the placenta, there was profound hypovolemia and uh, villus high drops, right? Global villus edema. This is fetal, fetal maternal hemorrhage. And the, I'm saving the gross image of the placenta for last because it's what I want to, to comment on. I've already said this a couple of times, I think in the, in the year, a couple of years I've been giving lectures here, which is as, as pathologists, our eyes are used to recognizing aberrances of things that are present that should not be there. We're not good at recognizing the absence of normal features. So in this right-hand placenta, you can, I can see that the chorionic vessels are virtually avolemic. I, I usually have to point this out to trainees when I'm giving a kind of a pop quiz kind of uh, question and answer session to say, what's wrong with this placenta? And they'll say, oh, I see incision marks. Maybe that was for cytogenetics. It's the avolemia that is the point that I want to make. This is never a postmortem phenomenon and is very strong suggestion uh, given the this the appearance of this fetus, that you're that it, this is going to be fatal fetal maternal hemorrhage, and this is the site of the fetal maternal hemorrhage with the fetal red cells. Okay, another case uh, of a fetus, and uh, I'm not going to talk about the exact causes of demise, but I wanted to point out several features. This is a fetus that was uh, macrosomic, born to a uh, a mom who did not get antenatal testing, but was likely um, a diabetic, gestational diabetic. And again, there is no maceration. There's no skin slippage. There's no uh, blistering of the skin. Um, I, I'm not sure. I don't know the details of the delivery, so I'm not sure what this varying plethora and, uh, and pallor is of the fetus. This cherry red discoloration of the lips is uh, an hypoxic change that, that I see pretty regularly with hypoxic modes of death. Um, although this fetus had a combination of reasons for demise. But what I also want to point out here is discoloration of the skin. There, there's uh, meconium in the creases, in the inguinal creases, um, you know, in the, the anal creases, it, gluteal folds uh, in this, on the skin, on the hair, I can see some meconium discoloration or in, on the scalp. Here is meconium aspiration. And this is a good example of what a granular meconium looks like. So there are fetal squames in here, but there's also this granular amorphous orangey brown material that is meconium aspiration. Above that is, uh, is a meconium discolored tongue. So you know that the, the fetus at a minimum uh, swallowed meconium prior to demise. And it, that's borne out in the lower panel when you see meconium filled uh, gastric contents, right? So of course, meconium, you should see a term in the distal uh, GI tract, but not in the stomach. So this was a case of, this is all the same fetus, of prolonged meconium discharge with meconium aspiration, the lungs, and ingestion in the intestinal tract. And on the upper uh, right-hand corner, it, it doesn't project terribly well, but there's petechial hemorrhage. So again, the element of an acute, an acute hypoxic element of this demise um, was of hypoxia. Although again, there, there, were, there was more pathology than just that. Okay, now in the last few minutes, I want to talk about time intervals between an intrauterine inter demise. And I sign out my autopsies this way, which is I use two intervals, the interval between the demise to delivery and the interval between the onset of whatever the intrauterine stress is and the intrauterine demise. So let me start with the first one because it's a little bit easier to talk about. Intrauterine demise to delivery intervals, how can you assess it based on visual observation? In the placenta, you can see, as we've talked about, I talked about the umbilical cord discoloration and microscopically the patterns of fetal vascular involution, umbilical myocyte changes. And on the fetal side, obviously external maceration and, uh, and discoloration, cutaneous discoloration. Microscopically, it is, there is a fairly stereotypical pattern of internal autolysis so that to, in a general sense, the if the demise to delivery interval is greater than 48 hours, it's complete cardiac uh, myocytolysis or, or autolysis, not cytolysis, autolysis. With the liver, it's something that's greater than four days. If it's complete intestinal autolysis, it's greater than a week. But as we all know, 
there are there's wide variation because of postmortem autolysis. So you're you're a trainee and you're doing an autopsy and you take care of the thoracic block first, and then you take care of the kidneys and the adrenal glands and you and the intestines you leave at, on the the bench at room temperature or at, at ambient temperature for some hours. Of course, you're going to get postmortem autolysis. You always get postmortem autolysis in stillbirths in the pancreas unless they are intrapartum. Uh, stillbirths. So you have to take that into, into account, the postmortem autolysis. Um, and here's an example of a, a relatively recent stillbirth where you see the myocytes, are, there's no autolysis whatsoever. And this bluish material is, uh, could either be uh, dystrophic calcification, in which case that long preceded the demise, or in this case, it's congenital sepsis. So these are intravascular cocci. The intravascular cocci, because the the amniotic fluid should be sterile in utero. You should never have organisms in the fetal body in a stillbirth. It should be a sterile environment, even if the interval between demise and delivery was weeks. So this is clearly congenital sepsis and the fetus died within about 24 hours of delivery because of the absence of myocardial autolysis. Here's an adrenal gland at low power, just to say that this, there's, this is completely autolytic. Um, all I can tell you is unless this adrenal gland sat on the bench for many hours, that this is probably from a, a fetus where the demise to delivery interval was some days in duration. Um, and now I want to talk to the time intervals and in intrauterine demise that apply to the stress interval to demise. In other words, when, when the process began that culminated in fetal death, what, how long did that last? Was it an acute a subacute or chronic mode of intrauterine stress that led to the fetal demise. In the placenta uh, and fetal blood uh, and the placenta proper, you can assess the uh, normal blast degree of NRDCs, if any, and the presence of meconium. They're general features of intrauterine stress. And in, in the fetus, there are organ-based changes. The most sensitive is, it, well, I'm sorry, an immediate, the most acute that you can see probably are is thoracic visceral petechiae on the, in the epicardial surface of the heart, the visceral surface of the lungs, and uh, the, the visceral surface of the, uh, the external surface of the thymus. And those are, those have an element of hypoxia in them when you see visceral petechiae. Thymic stress involution is the most sensitive of all the organs to assess the, the chronicity of, uh, of stress prior to demise. Acute cortical apoptosis is up, up to about a day. Subacute cortical thinning is days. And actual thymic atrophy, where the thymic weighs less than expected, um, is one of chronic stress in utero. You can also use the adrenal gland. Uh, to uh, look at uh, the adrenal cortex. If the, the definitive cortex, I'll show you, there's, there's a cystic change, corticolysis, that's an acute phenomenon. If you get lipidization of the fetal cortical adrenal cells, that's a subacute pattern. And you can get hepatic steatosis, which we usually don't pay attention to. You can actually get that in a relatively uh, acute period of time. And these are my last few slides. So on the left-hand side, we have a thymus. The thymus, this starry sky pattern mimics Burkitt lymphoma because the thymus sites undergo apoptosis and resident macrophages gobble them up. So this is evolution from acute into subacute because you've got loss of, so the, the, the starry sky pattern is acute, but the, the diminution of the cortex is a subacute pattern. So visually at term, the cortex should be about two thirds to three quarters of your visual field of the thymus uh, on a cross section. If it's less than that, you should consider subacute stress prior to demise. On the right hand side is thymic atrophy where this was a very, a very small organ. And you see you even get fatty replacement. You can in these uh, in thymic atrophy. So this would have weighed less, much less than normal uh, compared to gestational age. The other thing I want to say, there's also post-mortem post autolysis. You see the nuclear smudging, that's independent of how long the stress was present. So that you're, you're actually having two bits of information about intervals, post-mortem autolysis, but separate from that, how long was the fetus stressed before demise? Here's that adrenal gland, definitive cortex. Uh, you can see this cortical lysis, that's an acute stress change. Uh, on the right is this lipid accumulation of the fetal cortex of the adrenal gland, subacute. Here's a, a liver from a, actually a biliary atresia patient. I couldn't find one that I was certain was, uh, was uh, hepatic steatosis from a, an intrauterine demise, but I'm using this to make the point. You can see hepatic steatosis in fetal demise within a day uh, of stress 
before the demise. And I asked one of my senior colleagues once how long it takes. He said, probably it's only about 12 hours before you get you see lipid accumulation in hepatocytes. So hepatic steatosis. There are other organ-based findings, but these are the more common ones that I use. I want to offer uh, a couple of references. I did a pathology outlines um, piece on uh, stillbirth. It's here. There's an ARP fascicle, uh, placenta fascicle that my, my good buddy Drusilla Roberts wrote, and I wrote a stillbirth chapter in that. And there are, uh, are these three articles from David Janess in the early 1990s, 1992, that use the fetus the, and the placenta, both gross and microscopic features, to discern the interval between demise fetal demise and delivery. And these are still what we use. We've not come up with a better methodology. And this is a, apparently a recent picture of, of David. He was, a, he was my first real mentor. And um, when he stopped practicing pathology, he took up art. So he became an artist in his later years. And this is my last slide to say that it's important to be good and kind people in the world. These are birthday flowers on the left that we sent to uh, daughter number two, and these are some birthday flowers that I recently received from my sister-in-law and brother-in-law. So do good in the world, be nice people. Okay, and I am now done. Let me see how I get back to my video. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Boyd, for this excellent talk. Uh, you can turn your video on. Okay, uh, let me see, how do I get here? There we go. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm looking at questions online, uh, Dr. Boyd. I can see one question on YouTube. Let me read it for you. Uh, this question is, what should be the algorithm, what should be the algorithm to approach for stillbirth, placenta and fetal organs? Uh, both should be examined or which organs of fetus must be examined? So I'm not sure if I could uh, read it correctly. Yeah, uh, everything. Oh my goodness! You, you know, it, it's when you have the uh, when you have the ability to to do a fetal autopsy following demise. You you want to ideally sample every organ, and so so to conserve uh, conserve uh, laboratory resources, you don't have to put one organ in, on one slide. You can put a number of organs in a, a single slide if that's part of the issue is that you have limited resources that you can use. Um, just identify which slide is the left kidney, which is the right, et cetera. And, you know, in the, in the left kidney, you can put the left adrenal gland, you can put the pancreas, et cetera. Um, so I would say all organs, but the ones I gave you are the, are the, are the organs that I most commonly utilize early at first, you know, first pass to try to assess intervals of uh, stress prior to demise. Um, I will say though, this is not quite this question that I've, I've lectured this again for decades because I've been doing this for decades, that if I have two specimens to look at with a, with a fetal demise, particularly near term, I have the fetus or the placenta, I will choose the placenta every time if I can only look at one because the, the placental footprints that, uh, that occur in the face of fetal demise are almost always present. Uncommonly is the cause of demise not seen. When I say uncommonly, the statistics say, you know, demise, you can call, you can discern the cause of demise in only 50% of stillbirths. I, my experience, uh, especially those closer to term is it's more like 90 or 95%. And, and the placental footprints almost always have the cause of demise, but that's not always, right? There are exceptions to that. The fetus provides additional information. It provides the intervals of timing and it also provides, in some cases, the, an, an underpinning for a cause. So, for example, with complex congenital heart disease, that can lead to fatal fetal vascular malperfusion because of deranged cardiac output. Um, I don't know if that fully answers. And in terms of the placenta, standard placental uh, slides, most institutions, including ours, uh, put in extra disc slides with demises, but there was a paper that showed that the standard number is, is usually, which should be three central paracentral full thickness discs, disc sections, uh, it should be sufficient. Is there another question? Yes, uh, there is another one uh, on YouTube again. So let me read that for you as well. So the brown discoloration of meconium. So this is the question about that. So does the intensity of color distinguish the severity? 
No, that's a good question. Well, in, in a way, because you would say, yes, that's more meconium that's been taken up into a single macrophages, macrophage, but more more informative is the density of meconium macrophages. So the more you have in a strip, a horizontal strip of, let's say, the membranes, the denser the meconium discharge, right? Because it's all traveling into the placenta at a relatively uh, uniform rate. The deeper it goes into the cord membranes or chorionic plate, the longer the meconium has been present. Another question. Well, we're at the hour. Um, I'm happy to take more questions, but we can. Yeah, no. Uh, so any question from the residents and fellows at uh, Texas Children's or University of North Carolina? Maybe you can pass them on to Dr. Boyd. Do you guys have any questions for Dr. Boyd? I don't see your questions on YouTube, maybe, or Facebook. Thank you very much. I see we're at the top of the hour. No, no, thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Boyd, for this excellent session covering so many different aspects. And for the viewers, if you want to access the other lectures that Dr. Boyd has delivered earlier, so you can go to our uh, past cast YouTube channel and Dr. Boyd gave a talk on maternal and fetal vascular malformation. You can watch that. And there is another talk on markers of intrauterine stress. So the meconium and nucleated red cells that is also available on our uh, YouTube channel. So let me quickly uh, end this session by uh, sharing this last slide. So our next lecture is coming up on September 25th and we will have a different talk. So that would be on blood bank and our speaker is going to be Dr. Matthew Alkins, who is Director of Transfusion Medicine at Sunny Upstate University, and as we have residents today. So maybe this would be useful for you, and he is going to talk about transfusion reactions, and it's going to be on September 25th at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. And thanks to our viewers who have joined from different parts of the world, and Dr. Boyd, you would be happy to know that we had viewers who joined from uh, so Slovakia, Mexico, Accra, Pakistan, Argentina, Italy, Nairobi, India, Nepal, and of course, uh, USA. And special thanks to the residents and fellows at Texas Children's Hospital and the residents at University of North Carolina. Thanks for joining. And, and if you like this lecture, so please follow podcast on uh, our YouTube channel. And then, you know, we also have uh, our, uh, um, what's it called? Um, Facebook page so you can follow us on Facebook page as well as on the website and we have an Instagram channel as well so you can follow us there too and thank you again uh, Dr. Boyd we appreciate very much thank you thank you